He has served as India's High Commissioner to the UK and India's Ambassador to the European Union, Belgium and Luxembourg. He has held senior positions in the Ministry of External Affairs and Ministry of Finance. Dr. Bhagwati was educated at St. Stephen's, Tuft University and Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has worked for 11 years in the World Bank's Treasury Department. He has authored several research publications and books and including The Promise of India, How Prime Minister's Nehru to Modi Shaped the Nation. He's also a regular columnist in Business Standard. Mr. Johar Sarkar is a retired Indian civil servant with 42 years of experience in administration. He is a researcher, publisher of articles, author, and a public speaker. He was the CEO of Prasar Bharati from 2012 to 2016. He relocated to Kolkata in November 2016 to take up his long pending research and publication work. He has been elected the chairman of the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta. He also served as secretary of the Ministry of Culture from late 2008 to February 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our distinguished panelists with a round of applause. Hi everyone. As you've realized, uh, my friend Jamini is intensely overqualified. He has just too many degrees. Remind me of a thermometer, so many degrees on it and all that. But uh, I know him as a wonderful person, an eminent scholar, a free thinker, and that is a breed that they've stopped production, free thinkers. And whoever is around, uh, they're doing not so nice things to them. Now, this book, this very forbidding book of 385 pages, uh, debted me for a few days. But then when I picked it up and I went through it, I realized that this fellow has done us a great favor. I'm not selling his book, don't worry. All I'm saying is it done us a great favor because every time we feel like looking back to our Prime Minister and his or her regime, we need certain facts. So A, I find it lucidly written, packed with facts on the political side, on the social side. And then, like most economists, he has to pontificate. He has to give you, give you what's wrong with the economy, which, as you know, no two economists ever agree upon. Uh, that's part of the trade. Mm. So he has given us this wonderful insights into the economy. He's covered all the prime ministers, and which is exactly what the present prime minister is trying to cover by removing Nehru from the Nehru Memorial and putting all of them, including Charan Singh and others who came in by default, uh, also unequal terms with Nehru and others. Anyway, never mind. People have their own myopic ways of looking at life. Now, we'll start this conversation. I'll ask mm -hmm. Jamini, basically. Jamini, what uh, you've heard about his qualifications, right? diplomat, work there. He has actually been very favored. Nobody would send me to the World Bank for 11 years. Anyway, uh, Jamini, what compelled you to take up a project like the one year you've done. The, the full compendium, and incidentally, his book doesn't read like a bureaucrat's note sheet. You will actually understand it. You understand? Those who are used to bureaucrat's note sheet would know there's a lot of English there, but you never know where it's going. So, but this guy actually makes sense. He makes eminent sense, in fact. Well, thank you so much, Jawahar. A very good evening to all of you. Thank you for coming on a Saturday evening. Uh, well, your question was, what made me write it? It's actually Penguin's offer to me to write a book. They said, please write a book, we'll publish it. Now, I pondered on it for, for, for some time and then uh, said, okay. I look back on my own life, as he says, I don't know about the degrees, but I've been very fortunate. I worked... Uh, in the Ministry of Finance for many years, in the Ministry of External Affairs for many years, and the World Bank, as he pointed out, for 11 years, and also with Dr. Raja Ramanna and Dr. M. R. Srinivasan in the Department of Atomic Energy. So it's uh, somewhat unusual um, when I look at my colleagues. So I said, okay, let me see if I can use my experience to evaluate how our Prime Ministers uh, 
did, in my opinion, with regard to foreign policy issues as well as economic issues. And then I thought to myself, how do I do it? Do I do it by decade? I finally decided to do it by prime ministers. And you might ask, uh, you know, how do you compare across prime ministers over decades? And uh, I've chosen uh, three personal characteristics, which are character and uh, competence and charisma. So those were the three characteristics. And Penguin was happy to publish the book. You said prime ministers and character. <laughs> no, 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 just I, I want to. Uh, yeah. Some of them did have, I mean, not all of them, but. I mean, you can say, uh, comment on character, whether there was any character or there was not. But I thought it was an important element, in fact, the overwhelmingly important com component of any public figure, according to me, is character. You can be immensely competent and have tremendous charisma. Without character, you are zero. Uh, so that's uh, what made me write the book, because I also found that many of my younger friends and children of my friends, now that uh, one is old enough. Uh, so there are many who have grandchildren among my friends. And coming back to them and people who are called millenn millennials, those who were born in 1980 or after that, I found that perhaps because of the pressures of study, because nowadays unless you're working very hard in school, you won't get into a good college. If you don't work hard in college, you can't get a good job. Uh, I'm not saying that things were very simple when we were young, but I have a feeling that given the numbers that uh, have increased so much in terms of our population and in terms of those who are seeking to enter the job market, things are very rough. So I thought in one book, if I can uh, help people to understand what happened in the country better, understand from my point of view, somebody else might say, oh my God, you've distorted things here and there. But uh, I have tried to uh, be as, I was about to use the word truthful, as objective as possible. Um, and you know, you keep hearing uh, from some ministers, ex-ministers and ex-civil servants and others who speak about uh, or who say that they, they, they spoke truth to power. Usually it doesn't happen because you'll be moved. In, in their defense, you'll be moved from whatever position you have if you speak too much truth to too much power. But now that I'm no longer in government, one used to speak whatever one could within <coughs> the government. I felt that was another contribution I could make to better understanding. You, you can't understand today's India if you don't look back. You'll say, I mean, I don't need to tell those who have studied history voluntarily in college, but uh, some people feel, you know, what's the point of knowing about yesterday? We need to look at today and tomorrow. Like, look at JNK. Look at any burning issue today, whether it is the CAA or whether it is Jammu and Kashmir or India's relations with its neighbors, you will come to a very distorted understanding of uh, what it is all about. And uh, with your permission, Jawahar, if I may elaborate with regard to JNK, now, there is this mistaken notion that uh, the first prime minister uh, had lots of degrees of freedom. I'll give you two or three uh, uh, facts. The first Indian to be a naval chief, it used to be the Royal Indian Navy till 1958. It used to be the Royal Indian Air Force till 1954. It used to be uh, the Indian Army was headed by a British general till 1948. So when Nehru took over under the Independence of India Act, a governor general was mandatory. mandatory. And uh, this business of, you know, there was some special personal relationship with Lord Mountbatten and that's why he was there. He was also chairman of the Defense Committee. So these facile stuff about how Nehru could have done this or that, I have listed for you in the book what was the equipment of the Indian Army? 90% of it, no prizes for guessing, was of British origin. Why would the British <laughs> give you any other equipment than whatever they can sell spare parts of? And the rest 10% was American equipment. Right now, in terms of hardware, 60% of it is from what was Soviet Union and has now become Russia. So, 
the dependence on a supplier of military equipment is huge and deep. So when we talk about whether Nehru took the issue to the UN, there's a lot of pressure from the Brits to take it to the UN. Could he have done it, not done it? I would hesitate to second guess. The other point which is made again and again, and then we should come closer to today, is that if only Sardar Patel had been Prime Minister, this country would have been a much better place. Now, maybe, who knows what if is a very difficult question to answer. But uh, my sense is, and this is my sense, I don't have any evidence of it, is that Mahatma Gandhi chose Nehru and Sardar Patel accepted it even though he was 14 years older. And uh, I think, I think, I don't know what was in uh, the mind of the father of the nation, but my sense is that he evaluated not just qualities of head, but also qualities of heart. And he felt that Nehru had the right combination, whether it is 60, 40, 70, 30, depends upon how you put it. But he felt that Nehru had the qualities to lead uh, independent India. And Sardar Patel and Nehru exchanged letters, which, are, which, is, which reflects just how close they were. As you all know, 30th of January, 1948, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated in what was known as the Birla House on what is today called the Tis January Marg. And uh, for about an hour and a half or more, Sardar Patel was in conversation with Gandhi and then he left and Gandhi went out of the house for his evening prayers. When Nathuram God say, uh, shot him dead. So I don't know whether you have looked at the media coverage of that time. It blamed Sardar Patel as the Home Minister for Gandhi's death. I said, they, they said, what kind of a Home Ministry is he running? Where are the intelligence agencies? Where is their physical protection for the father of the nation? And it is Nehru who wrote an intensely emotional and moving letter to Sardar Patel saying that he is not to blame and he should not, he should disregard this kind of criticism. And he in turn wrote a very emotional letter to Pandit Nehru. All of this is available, it's all in the public record, you'll get them in books or you can go to the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in Delhi and you can look it all up. Uh, I'll stop there for a moment before we move on to uh, other issues, maybe a line on the economy. The other thing which people say is, oh my God, Nehru's socialism, I think Nehru made mistakes in foreign policy, not in the economy or not on the economy, average growth rates between 1947 and 1964, May, when he died, is about 3.6, 3.7. Now, some economists uh, like K. N. Raj have said Hindu rate of growth, but what was the rate of growth between 1900 and 1947? It was somewhere between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. Since population growth rates were 2.5 or 2.3, so every year India was becoming poorer in per capita terms between 1900 and 1947. From 1947 to 1964, on an average per capita basis, Indians were growing richer by 1.8 percent. Because 2 point something was the rate of growth of population and the economy was growing at over 3.7, 3.8 percent. So on those two counts, I wanted to just set the record straight. And foreign policy, he messed up on China, he messed up on a number of things including on uh, being very standoffish vis-a-vis -vis the US. The US had set up bases in Peshawar, in what is today Pakistan, and Kumari Tola, in what is today Bangladesh, not far from Dhaka, from where they used to fly U-2 flights. All of this is explained uh, in some detail, and obviously India could not, and did not, and thank God it did not provide military base facilities to the US. We did not join Cento and Seattle, etc. Uh, in the 50s, the U.S. started giving defense equipment to Pakistan, etc. But I'll stop there and uh, wait for Jawahar's next question. Now, mine was more of a request. You see, you know so much economics. Uh, haven't you ever thought of joining, wearing saffron and joining? Uh, it would have saved the nation anyway. Uh, no, just a thought. Just a thought. We are civil servants. We are both civil and uh, servile. Uh, you see a lot. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. are. Uh -huh. Now, uh, Nehru, you have given your insight, and 
as we know, the first pulsations of a equity-based or equitable economy was there even before he started the Avadi resolution and went socialist, so to say. You spoke about the foreign policy. But how on earth did he tolerate that insufferable V.K. Krishna Menon? People who know V.K. Krishna Menon would think that our Mitro is a darling. Huh. I, agree. I agree. I agree. I, I, uh -huh. I'm surprised too. Because uh -huh. if you look at the British intelligence records, they speak very poorly of uh, Mr. Krishna Menon. They see him as a drug addict, which he was not. It's like opioid use. He was used to painkiller and he was uh, subject to tremendous mood swings. But that can happen to so many people. Uh, I think the reason why they were closed was because they were both in the UK in the 1930s. And you have to give credit to Krishna Menon for trying to get the Bhadralok of London to support Indian independence. Now, that does not mean that he should have been uh, raving and ranting against the West uh, at the UN. Why? I mean, why? I mean, you've been a uh, high commissioner in the UK. Tell me, why are the best British trained people of India the biggest ranters against British imperialism? Shashi is a good example. Uh, Shashi, I have to ask him whether he's got an Indian passport. Anyway, so I'm not very sure. Not very sure. But why do they He's a member of parliament, so must have filed oh, so his nomination. Well, maybe OCI card per mil gaya. OCI you card. never know. <laughs> uh, maybe a stick. Tell me why. I mean, that's, that's one observation which is off the book. Uh, because you have seen the pomposity of the Indian community in London, if that's one trait that stands out, or anywhere else. Why is it that the guys who were trained and fed on British... Uh, worldview turn out to be the most anti-Brit? Well, this is a sort of, you know, profound generalization on uh -huh. which I may uh -huh. not be able to comment. There uh -huh. will be individuals who have their views. Uh -huh. Perhaps they are… No Apart from selling books. Uh, perhaps they know a lot about uh, uh -huh. British history. I mean, know a lot about our own Indian history. I mean, you all know this, you know. You don't need… Uh, Angus Madison to tell you this, that, you know, weavers in Murshidabad were earning as much as the best weavers anywhere in the world, including the UK in the early 18th century, 1710, 1720. And those are rumors, I think, that their thumbs were cut off once the British took charge over here. No, I think uh, our economy like slid. That. But our economy slid because we didn't participate fully in the… In the why didn't we come up with the industrial… Why was there no James Watt here? I mean, those are profound questions which we will need to figure out. Why was there no Rutherford here? Uh, you know, there were so many… Why was there no Michael but Faraday? But we are flying planes uh, 3,000 years before. <laughs> what well, happened? What uh, happened? Where are the hangers? Good luck to those who believe those kinds of stories about we had the Brahmastra, that means we had mm -hmm. uh, uh, a fission bomb and things of that sort. Right. Now, I think uh, more seriously, I don't think anybody seriously thinks that. That is, some people no, perhaps… No, 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 no. It's, pro it's pronounced from the highest levels. I can give you in my mobile, I have about 11 very profound uh, sayings by senior ministers on the state of advancement during the ancient period. It's I, all given in black and white. I get a sense, Jawahar, that you don't believe them and neither do I. So let us not take up time of our audience on people who want to make extravagant claims about our past. In fact, uh, I feel that, you know, some people are trying to You create might be an anti-nationaler. <laughs> some people so are I. trying to make a, uh, a distinction between what they call Bharat and what is India. So, since I'm talking in English, uh, which perhaps 1% of the people understand, I mean, this is, uh, you know, you, people say 10%, 12%. Yes, they can write their name in English, perhaps even read a book in English, but the speed at which I'm speaking, only this audience understands and perhaps uh, a total of one or two percent of India. So, to that extent, this is very elitist what we are doing, since we are talking to each other in English. And uh, yes, there is a vernacular speaking Bharat. But does it mean that uh, those who speak in the vernacular are necessarily more nationalistic or more patriotic? Nationalistic is a dangerous word nowadays. More patriotic than others. 
there seems to be some kind of an inverse snobbery about knowing vernacular. While we, English speaking, need to better understand the vernacular speaking and perhaps all of us should know at least one Indian language well enough to be able to write an article if not a book. And uh, we grew up in schools and colleges where English was the medium. And similarly, those who claim they are part of Bharat should also try and open their minds to the fact that there is a lot of literature, there is a lot of knowledge in languages other than the Indian languages. Even today, higher education, and Jawar and I are from a time where uh, in the 70s, and late 60s to 70s, but even today, I think higher education, most of the textbooks are still in English. It's not true in China or in Russia. They're textbooks and they're not slouches in science and technology or in the medical area, medical fields. But in India, we are still dependent on English. English is one more Indian language. This is what I call the revenge of the pink panther. They come and colonize us, we take their language. There are more Indians speaking English. But that's or some Indian English. They won't yeah. understand it anyway. <laughs> well, in, in times to come, nobody will remember Queen's English. Only Indian English will be oh, left. Oh, you really mean so? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention was that this whole, you mentioned socialism and Avadi Congress and uh, that session of the Congress party, the annual session. Uh, you, you have a look at um, uh, Milton Friedman's life. I don't know how many of you know that Milton Friedman's PhD, this, I mean, this is the famous Chicago monetarist, uh, the economist who is very much in favor of private sector. So, and I'll related to India in a second, uh, Milton Friedman felt that, uh, that uh, in his PhD thesis, he suggested that there should be no um, uh, registering of medical doctors. And the logic for that was that you are restricting the number of doctors and therefore raising their prices. He was coming up with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a private sector argument as to, so then of course his PhD thesis was not accepted because his PhD advisors and others felt that this is, uh, doesn't make sense. You need to have a licensing requirement to have a certain standardization in terms of minimum qualifications to treat a patient. So he had to wait till 1945. But then he became a great advocate and, uh, and I'll leave it to the house to decide on this because this is true for India today and I'll relate it to today's India, 2020's India. Milton Friedman was a great advocate for stopping all conscription. When Eisenhower was president and right up to Nixon's time, Nixon abolished it, there was conscription. So anybody and Nixon everybody... Nixon was forced to abolish it, what? not abolish it. Um, uh, but there were many people, including Eisenhower, under whom he was vice president, who were suggesting that he should not. He, they felt, General Westmoreland felt that he should not. Because they felt a volunteer army means these are the people uh, who will only come for money. They will not come out of patriotism. But be that as it may, a free market, free economy argument was made by Milton Friedman. Now, how do I relate it to 2020? We do not have compulsory conscription. What does that mean? And I leave the thought. I have no answers to the question I'm about to pose. Suppose we had compulsory military service. So everyone from the billionaires to those who have very little, have to serve in the army and let us say that you have a conflict and therefore you can get shot dead and you might, your father might own 15 houses and whatever and also a private jet but you could die in a skirmish at the border. You know where I'm taking this. So to the extent that you do not have people of a certain income group as part of our armed forces, one can be muscular about India's foreign policy because it is those who depend on the army or the navy or the other forces, including the paramilitary forces, uh, for a job who go and die. And then, of course, you can wrap their bodies in the national flag. Uh, Samir, come. Ananda is right here. Sure. I see a friend who's just come in. We were together in college. Mm. Uh, so, these are issues which are not easy to resolve. I think each country has to figure it out for, himself, for itself. But uh, my sense is that far too much is said nowadays in terms of uh, jingoism, which 
would perhaps be less acceptable to people in decision making circles if their children had to compulsorily serve in military uh, in the military i mean the white i'm i'm kind of saying any kind of uniform and they would have to spend two three whatever and in those years if they are posted to a border region or a sensitive place like jnk and get blown up just how uh, should we say gung ho would they be about this kind of uh, jingoistic uh, 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 militarism which creeps into their words. Lovely. That, that one is a lovely one. I will turn it around. What he is saying is those guys who keep whatsapping saying, hum ladke dekhenge, hum ye karenge, hu karenge and all that, just tell them to join the army. Just tell them to join the army and it's a lovely thought to have, you know, fat kids coming from those Hmm. Ah, you are right. Politics has, don't, doesn't have those high standards. Yes, I forgot. Now we move on to the, uh, to a chap, uh, to a Prime Minister whom I hold in high regard and I am so glad you used that short term for uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri, the meek shall inherit the world. Lal Bahadur Shastri who succeeded Nehru, for those of us who remember and those of us who never saw him, was uh, the last person you would imagine could stand up to somebody like Bhutto. This chap was this height, in Dhoti, frail and Bhutto and uh, the uh, Pakistani establishment would sort of look down at him. And he gave a fitting reply fitting reply in his war, but more important than that, and that's why I think where I liked your emphasis, he is the first person, first Prime Minister we'd hold responsible for India's food self-sufficiency. All of us went through food crisis those days. Everyone in Calcutta also, we used to line up and get essential commodities. I mean, if you didn't get up at four o'clock, you'd miss the quota of vegetable oil. It was that bad. So, Lal Bahadur Shastri's, as a Prime Minister, his emphasis on the economy and the food, grow more food, jai jawan, jai kisan, and all that, they did much more for the economy in that one and a half years than somebody has done in five and a half years. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Jawahar. I think uh, the Green Revolution, a lot of credit is given to Indira Gandhi and deservedly so. Uh -huh. But Norman Borlaug and those uh -huh. of you who remember that name had experimented with high yielding wheat seeds in Mexico. And it was Shastri who started off uh, the process. So to that extent, we owe him uh, uh, a debt of gratitude for having initiated that. Because today, young people don't even think twice about Grain, rice, wheat, I mean, this is not an issue at, at all. Certain state governments are providing rice at one rupee a kilo, heavily subsidized, and uh, some are suggesting that they're going to even give the pulses uh, at highly subsidized rates. So, basic food That's stuffs. That's for the people, huh? <laughs> <laughs> basic food stuffs is not an issue for the young people. Uh, but, but there was a time when we were young where Shastri, in fact, suggested you give up a meal. Uh, every week uh, and he himself would give up a meal, skip a meal because we were short of food grains. When I have tracked that from the time of Nehru but I would like to say a word about Indira Gandhi and then perhaps move on to Narasimha Rao with your uh, permission because… I am looking here only at the time, that's all. That's I'm right. Not, so time I don't have is, so many whatsapps. Ta time is such a short… Uh, time is such a commodity that is mm -hmm. always in short supply. So, mm -hmm. word about Indira Gandhi, I think compared to Nehru, she did much better in foreign policy and bombed on the economy and Nehru did better with regard to the economy and did worse in foreign policy, contrary to what most people think. So, you may agree or disagree with me, but have a look at the book to see if uh, what I have said I have substantiated. Now, coming to uh, foreign and policy, everybody knows about Bangladesh, nothing needs to be said. She stood firm and I think uh, she showed tremendous nerves of steel to be able to go through with the process which resulted in the creation of a country. Uh, 
But on the economy, I don't need to get into MRTP, FERA, the number of laws which were either approved, and I will not even get into the emergency. I think the one thing which it did, which is plaguing us till today in several parties, is this whole dynastic thing of first trying to push Sanjay Gandhi. I would strongly recommend that have a look at that period for you to understand just how much damage has been done. I will not mention the names of families in UP and Bihar and Andhra Pradesh and so on and so forth, or Tamil Nadu. There wasn't this kind of a trend when I was in school and college. This started with Indira Gandhi. She started off this thing which other parties started copying. So that was a disastrous thing as far as I'm concerned. So I'm particularly, um, should we say, uh, you know, uh, feel very saddened when I hear of this Nehru Gandhi dynasty. And I will read out a line from my book, a line or two. An extremely distressing error that some com commentators make is to speak of Nehru and Indira Gandhi in the same breath as the Nehru Gandhi dynasty. The only way that Nehru and Indira Gandhi were related was that he was a loving father and she a doting daughter. In everything to do with modes of governance, building of institutions, transparency and personal values, they were as different as day and night. Uh, so that's what I feel about Indira Gandhi and I'll gloss over Rajiv Gandhi, you know, this business of uh, a son succeeding a mother, you know, these things happen <laughs> with kings. So, unfortunately, our political system was not developed enough. There was a tremendous, uh, should we say, wave of sympathy for Indira Gandhi. You, you're forgetting the efficiency of Doordarshan, where you had a televised funeral, completely televised funeral of Mrs. Indira Gandhi and the dutiful son going all around the pyre. Anyone who saw that would sort of wipe his handkerchief and go and vote. That was the last successful thing that Doodarshan did. By the time I went there, it was already in ICU. Okay. Good point uh, that you made, uh, Jawar. The, the only supplementary point I will make is that, you know, the people trusted her. But my question to myself, and I leave it to the audience, to, did she deserve that trust? Maybe she belied that trust. So, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, poor chap. When said, we move on to Narasimha Rao, please, from Indira Gandhi's very strong state socialism that went on, people say that, what's wrong with state socialism? It gives you equity, gives you this thing. I'll give you an example. This was the time I was getting kicked around between Bengal government and central government. This time I was kicked out from there to there, Delhi. And you won't believe this was the last days of Mrs. Gandhi's regime, so to say going on through Rajiv Gandhi and all that. The counters of Udyog Bhavan, which is the Ministry for Industry, Commerce and everything else, you couldn't get into that godforsaken building. We, those who carried these dog tags, just couldn't get in there because before Diwali, every joker was there with a pile of suit lens to be given from, God knows, maybe from secretary down to Chaprasi. That was a degree of institutionalized corruption. And within that short tenure, we went into near bankruptcy, saw Narasimha Rao come, go in for the boldest measures possible and release all the economic energies of the nation. So I've given a very journalistic view, you give the expert view you on see, Narasimha Rao. You see, the, what Mrs. Gandhi had done was systematically increase the hold of the government on the economy. For anything you needed in the 80s, now young people will laugh, to get a scooter, to get a two-wheeler, you had to wait for years. Yes. And if, if, a, if a relative of yours lived abroad and could provide whatever it was, 300, 400 dollars, then you jump the queue. Today, people cannot even imagine such a situation, but that's what we lived through. And all this was because of control. Telephone, telephone. Telephones, landlines. Telephone. But Those who have not been ticked off by the 199 lady, <laughs> insisting on the one who was supposed to give you assistance, your existence is not worth it. Uh. You pick up the phone, dial 19 and say, ask for some assistance. And if you are not ticked off, <laughs> you won't. And incidentally, how many we have come down to those landlines, the great uh, socialist paradigm, 
is we have only 15 million landmines today against 1.1 billion non-state owned mobile lines. But over, over, I'm glad you mentioned those numbers because over here I must give credit to Rajiv Gandhi. So somewhere around 1983 while he was being groomed before 84 when his mother was assassinated, they had started off with CDOT and read about it elsewhere or in my book and you'll get a sense of how the telecom revolution started then. Yes, Mr. Sam Petroda was one of them who was heading this particular technology mission. But, so you have to give Rajiv Gandhi that credit. He was actually uh, forward-looking to that extent. He thought about the use of computers. In those days, we still called them computers because that's all we had, desktop. There were no laptops in the sense we have them today and definitely no iPads. So yes, Rajiv Gandhi's contribution to making the government in particular and the country in general a little more mindful about technology. Jumping to Narsimha Rao, I mean Narsimha Rao has been vilified because of what happened at Babri Masjid and yes, he does deserve uh, 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 some criticism on that account depending upon your take, a lot of criticism or less uh, for having retired to his bedroom uh, while this was going on, ek dhakka or do masjid ko gira do, whatever was the slogan at that time. But the kind of reforms which he instituted, I don't know whether you remember, Narasimha Rao was chief minister in the early 70s and he was removed by Indira Gandhi because he had conducted or he had executed land reforms. And that didn't go well down, uh, didn't go down well with the rich large landholding elite of Andhra Pradesh and Mrs. Gandhi being sensitive to the rich. While she's preaching socialism, she was very sensitive to these rich, large landholding elite of Andhra Pradesh and removed uh, Narasimha Rao even though the Congress had an absolute majority by a number of seats in Andhra Pradesh. So this is the man who wanted to do more for the poor and who had effected land reforms who in 91 decided that we needed to get the state out of industrial policy, no more licensing, the rupee was overvalued. So I give him credit for having thought through that net-net, while certain things might become worse in the immediate future, over time, if you look at the rates of growth from 91 to 2020, they have been systematically, except for <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the last one year or more, uh, it have been well above the average rates from 1947 to 1990. So I would give Narasimha Rao a lot of credit for being able to think what is the management jargon out of the box. He thought out of the box and he was able to rationalize economic policies of which we are all beneficiaries today. Perfect. But let's also look at the other side. The BJP, and I am being anti-national by mentioning the name, uh, got two seats in 1984. And completed their as serial soon as Bhagwan Ram Ramayan, they shot up to 85 seats in 1989. And once they started saying Mandir hum wahi banayenge, 91, they went up to 126. But then Mandir Ham Mahi Banayenge is being decided not by them but by uh, Chief Justice. It's already been decided by Chief Justice ki wahi mandir banana hai. So we, we go through our own trying times. Come straight to the man that India will never forget. Uh, no, I'm not talking Mohammed bin Tuklak. I'm talking of, <laughs> I'm talking of uh, Mitro, whatever. I've forgotten his name because uh, Tell me, what does the man, oh, no, no, I, why am I asking you? I know because I served two and a half years under him. He understands politics far better than all these homegrown, uh, eaten harrow and uh, all this uh, bone marrow. He understands politics. But economics, with a teacher like you, who'd get minus numbers here. Now, you, you, you analyze this gentleman for me, please. I For will, all of us. I, I, I will in a moment. But mm. just to give uh, the audience a sense of what things were like in 91 and why this could have started in 71. 1991, the per capita income of India expressed in then 
current dollars as per IMF numbers, not my numbers, was somewhere around 380. Now, no prizes for guessing what was China's per capita income as recently, although Deng had started, Deng Xiaoping, that is, had started reforms in 1979, was 330. We were $50 ahead of China in 1991 when the reforms were initiated. So what has gone wrong? Why are we now one-fifth and some would say one-sixth of China's per capita income? So that we can, I, th I think, uh, just one line for Atal Bihari Vajpayee, I have great regard for him because uh, he decided that despite the downside of nuclear weapons, given the fact that this world talks to North Korea and you know who talks to North Korea, it's only reason why people talk to North Korea is because it has nuclear weapons and the only reason Saddam Hussein was bombed was because he does not have weapons of mass destruction. But coming back to your question on the current regime and the current Prime Minister, well, um, I have tried to, after having praised Vajpayee for that tremendous step, In and also book. for having... And a, uh, the, the, uh, the sense you I have... finish the book with Modi, yes. or Modi will finish it for us, I mean, whichever way you look at it. <laughs> well, uh, coming back to this uh, current government, I have a feeling... Oh, poor chap, I didn't notice you. <laughs> I didn't notice. I have a feeling that they have started off, you know, when Modi gave his first Independence Day speech in August 2014, let's give him credit. He said something which I found appealing and we'll come to the other things which I don't agree with. Uh, he said, you know, when uh, young men come home late, I mean college students come home late, the parents should ask them also, why are they coming at two and three and only ask the daughters. I thought that touched a chord. He's basically saying that men need to be conscious about uh, proper behavior towards ladies, not just at home but also in public spaces. So he touched various chords when it came to a question of uh, cleaner, better India. He touched a chord when he talked about let us uh, try and make our economy cleaner. Now demonetization was supposed to clean up the economy. My disappointment is, and if you look at paragraph 140 of the finance minister late Arun Jaitley, he was a friend, so may God bless his soul and may he rest in peace. Uh, I'm now going to mention the number of the paragraph. Paragraph 140 of his budget speech of 1st of February 2017. It ends with a line, we are largely a non-tax compliant country. Why does he say that? Because there are only 10 million people, correct? I mean, like, have a look at the paragraph. I might get the numbers wrong. I'm speaking from memory. Who show an income above 80,000 a month. And what, what kind of world are we living in? Just 10 million uh, income tax SSEs. A couple of them could be from the same family. Because, you know, as you know, richer families, husband, wife, children, they all file their tax returns because it's better for them. They can reduce the amount that they have to pay in tax. So, this is what the finance minister had to say. So, all this I, I, I liked. You and tell then, me, do you think this guy is an economic disaster? Do you I, agree? I don't mean You have think. used a very strong word, disaster, but I would no, no, say I'm not that, a diplomat, yaar. So, uh, <laughs> but you know, you need to be a little careful. I would say that they have made many missteps. Now, if that was the feeling in 2017, February, you needed to do more so that your direct tax collection, you look at newspaper headlines today, is going to be the lowest in God knows how many decades. I mean, why have we reached this situation? And then... Indirect? You know, I'm talking about direct. Direct taxes, lowest. Indirect, we can't. I have handled taxes for seven years. Indirect, the target is just one lakh crore a month. And it's never touching it. One, a couple of months it has touched uh, it. Ek bar, but total can't be 14. 14 or 14 But we have half. to ask, you know. We'll be doing at 10. Jawar, we have to ask ourselves this question also. Because on the 1st of July, I told you what the finance minister said on the 1st of February 2017. On the 1st of July, uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, addressing the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. And forget the first half of his speech. It's all available in YouTube. Just look it up. He says to the assembled chartered accountants in Hindi, because that's his preferred mode, uh, that is his preferred language in public addresses, he says, Aap sab bahut, 
मसरूफ थे आप लोग बहुत काम कर रहे थे रात भर आप लोग काम कर रहे थे लोगों के लिए जिन्होंने बहुत पैसे जमा कर दिया बैंकों में वॉट ही वॉज हिंटिंग एट वॉज चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट्स वे वर्किंग एंड बर्निंग द मिड नाइट ऑयल टू हेल्प पीपल रेगुलराइज द ह्यूज अमाउंट्स दैट दे हैड डिपॉजिटेड एज कैश इन बैंक अकाउंट्स सो इफ ही हैज ए ही हैज डिसाइडेड दैट ही नीड्स टू क्लेंस इंडियन इकोनॉमिक्स इट हैज माई फीलिंग इज दैट ही हैज गॉट इट रॉन्ग इन टर्म्स ऑफ द स्पीड विद विच ही वॉन्ट्स टू डू इट we are a largely non tax compliant society so how do you make it more ta- you'll never make get perfection but how do you make it more tax compliant i think he has made a mistake in thinking it can be done by these kind of highly by, visible by force by force by force and gst was started 20 years ago so we have all participated in as tax commission a little before that lk ha 1971 okay. so you can take it that long gst has to need requires a two year rehearsal plan even indonesia did it three year rehearsal plan before he executed it and he did it by freedom at midnight copying nehru midnight he announced yes i mean what a sorry no <laughs> i can't be that undiplomatic <laughs> anyway so this is the political side of it is 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 well understood no in, i think he uh, i have said it in my book i mean have you seen any large country where the same person is both finance minister and defense minister in 2014 why is bjp and uh, uh, even indira gandhi brought in a finance minister from a far away bank from canara bank i think mr pai from Uh, what is soul? what is nirmala's qualification for this thing her husband was an economist a strange yeah. husband i will not get into I personalities not, I, but i am making a more general point you name me one large economy any country because we are a large economy it's a very complex country in so many ways you name me one country which has i think what we have 16 different scripts when some people in europe when i was ambassador to europe said oh we are like india you know okay we have half your population but we have at that time 26 countries and you have uh, so many states and so we are similar i said no we are more complex and said in what way immediately very aggressive i said do you have 16 scripts they thought these indian languages are basically you know all related to each other they are not really languages i said not only are they separate languages with long histories of literature and philosophy and learning they have different scripts i cannot read the gurmukhi script i cannot read the malayalam script i can read the bengali script because i am from assam but that's because we have very similar uh, script except that we have a pat kota ra but but, <laughs> <laughs> but coming back to uh, the, the, this this Uh, complexity of india and the size was perhaps underestimated by the current prime minister by making one man in charge of both north block and a part of south block a part of north block because home ministry is also there in north block and a part of south block because defense and external affairs and the prime minister's office are is in south block it is not humanly possible i would have expected mr jaitley i knew to him say this prime minister prime minister is not possible for, it is showing that there is a lack of trust they don't complete, have large complete, enough teams germany it's complete centralization of a maniacal type it's not normal i mean as i said in delhi it's best to treat him early now treat him well i mean that's what i said he needs the type of centralization bhaiya you were there uh, attending diplomatic dinners we were here fighting it out let me tell you it's all the the before you end up because this may be the last prime minister of india we might get a ha ah, you won't get anything any model will do we don't know i am this is bharat nat so we don't know where we are heading we might have the last election we might not may not be able to laugh like this uh this last part where a man is capable of making as every thing every step that he takes in economics is wrong this is a good segue jawab for me to tell this uh, audience who do i rest how much uh, we are uh, running out of time audience yeah, so uh, wha- wha- one line and then it's all up to the audience 
you know who has brought the common people uh, who has brought this country back on track again and again it's the common man common man common woman no, again no, no, no. and no. again and again through the ballot box which is what we have seen every time mrs gandhi does excesses she's booted out in 1977 murarji this i flounders around the place he's thrown out so i would not underestimate the power of the ballot box the common sense of the common man Sorry, last time we got a recharge here in may that's all right i mean you pe give people a second chance if you think that he or she will do well and then you depending upon how you evaluate their performance i am not so pessimistic about uh, or so uh, alarmed about things in delhi or elsewhere because and that is the true quality of leadership to raise levels of optimism and reduce levels of cynicism right now i'm see, getting a sense that levels of cynicism are rising so that means leadership is not doing its job so when people talk oh, about our whatsapp university is not functioning that well well if i just finish the thought primary health and uh, basic education we know a lot of our people don't have it that's because leaders have not been able to enthuse the field workers to work with the kind of optimism which is required and that's why my book has a smattering of rk lakshman cartoons where the common man is looking bewildered or amused by what the leadership is doing and perhaps we now throw it open to the audience now where is chandril come he's come okay uh honorable members of the audience would you very short sharp questions to him what yes, ha huh. so quick, quick one fast uh, thank you very much why the financial aspect of the nrc was not discussed in the parliament and i am going to send to the detention camps okay you see i am not in parliament so i can't answer that question why it wasn't discussed so many things haven't what been what is discussed in parliament incidentally I wonder. Uh, no, I just thought of a counter question. And NRC is another example of something which needs to be better thought out. Sir, mm -hmm. sir, so, hmm. so I oh. have a question. Yeah, yeah. So I'm this side. On your right. On my right. This to my right. Okay. <laughs> so my question is like we have been speaking about the various PM. So I wanted to highlight the role of Kamra uh, Kamraj during the intervening period after Nehru's death, and like his kamraj plan or you know like his way of maneuvering shastri to the position of par putting desai on the sidelines so do you think that he was also a man who made india because he even had the guts to call indira gandhi gungi gudiya so what important so role he didn't call him gungi gudiya oh I dr ramono lohia called ram ramono lohia he, he kamraj was too yeah, much much so too clever <laughs> so <laughs> what role do you think kamraj played like to give india the shape it is because he is controlling the like he is the congress president and yet he is placing people in the position of power and that was the highest office uh, i think kamraj was a great leader he was a man who had risen from uh, the lower levels of income in what is today called tamil nadu and uh, nadar country i'm not absolutely and i think uh, he uh, showed tremendous foresight to bring lal bahadur shastri uh, in to become prime minister because lal bahadur shastri was a meek and retiring person but i think he um, miss uh, took what uh, should be the appropriate choice in again trying to <laughs> deny uh, muraji desai by bringing in indira gandhi because they somehow felt I mean, he's not really a part of the syndicate, you know. There was a gentleman from West Bengal called Atulya Ghosh. He used to wear dark glasses. I think people of a certain hey, generation. All, all in South Indian uh, Tamil prime ministers wear them. Uh, chief ministers. So I would say that uh, Mr. Kamaraj's favorite expression uh, expression was "Parkalam." Let us see. Let Let's us wait and see. Wait. Uh, that sounds uh, like something which is not right. But in many ways in India, you have to wait and see. Let's not rush in. So I would give him great credit. But in my book, I am dealing with chief executives of government of the central government. To that extent, since he was never a chief executive in the sense of being a prime minister, he and you know, as he says, it's the book is actually more than 380. Is actually 460 pages. the way the publisher has hidden that fact is the first 50 60 pages they put in roman numerals 
to try and hide the total number of pages because their point, Penguin said, if this, somebody sees this 460 pages, they're going to put the book down. Nobody's ever going to read it. Okay, last question because Sir. otherwise we'll be mopped out by Chandril fans. Sir, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so, your, so your book is about the Prime Ministers who shaped India. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, how much of that, uh, how much, I mean, and, and the men behind it are civil servants who really do the lot of work behind the scenes. So how much of a credit or how much of uh, would uh, you give to civil servants or influence? I would rather use the word influence. How much of an influence do civil servants have on the politicians or the prime ministers and the decisions? They have a tremendous amount of influence, particularly when it's an issue which is technical because by definition those in public life have to go to their constituencies, have to do so many other things which somebody who is sitting in an office in Delhi does not have it to do. But the reason why I have focused on the Prime Ministers is uh, evident from a book that Mr. Jairam Ramesh, I know him well, if he was here I would still say it, he's written about P. N. Haksa and there he tries to put the blame of Mrs. Gandhi's socialism within inverted commas because a lot of it was to push her own son uh, on P. N. Haksa. P. N. Haksa actually advised against Sanjay Gandhi being given 300 acres in uh, yeah. what is uh, today called Gurgaon. At that time, nobody knew about Gurgaon, but then Chief Minister Bansilal gave him uh, 300 acres. So, whether uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi moved P. N. Haksa, she put P. N. Dhar as her principal secretary. So, ultimately, the chief executive is the prime minister. So, you're absolutely right. In a multi volume book, I could have delved into who were the people who gave ideas to prime ministers and who did a lot of work. But I have apologized at the beginning in the introduction, in the prologue to the book, saying that I'm focusing only on the prime ministers because once I start digging deeper into the other ministers and those who are part of the IS or foreign service or whatever, then this book will have 12 volumes <laughs> and then definitely nobody will read it. So on that note, uh, no, no, there are too many people waiting for the next round. So I'm in next program. On that note, I thank Jamini Bhagwati, Dr. Jamini Bhagwati, MIT, Tufts, IFS, uh, High Commissioner, UK, or what EU, I, that's where I went and had dinner with you, uh, Brussels. So he's been through it all, and he has given a helicopter view of the whole scene for people who need ready references that are much more reliable than Google and much more elaborate and authentic at a drop of a hat. I have kept his book. I usually sort of re-gift books given to me. But I have kept his book because I will need it for some of my salacious anti-national writings. Okay? <laughs> On that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jawad.